day! I'm Dr. T, and welcome to my office. So today I would like to talk about how chemists communicate not just the values of the measurements that we make, but the quality of the measurements we make. When we make measurements, we have to weigh two competing uh, goals. For starters, I want a particularly high accuracy and a high precision measurement. But in order to do that, I'll almost certainly require more advanced instrumentation and more time and effort on my part. And frankly, I would rather use the easiest and potentially cheapest tool that I have to. So in this case, when I make a measurement, it's a trade-off. What am I doing? What is the function of this measurement going to be for? And how much effort do I want to put into it? If we were to say, look at a room, think of the room you're currently in. If we had a goal of determining how many people could comfortably fit in the room, uh, we wouldn't need to measure it particularly accurately. You would need decent accuracy, don't get me wrong, absolute garbage numbers are absolute garbage, uh, but you could measure the room by pacing it off. You could be off by a fair amount, but would still get a perfectly good number for your objective of determining how many people would comfortably fit in the room. That said, if instead your goal was to carpet the room, you would need to measure that quite a bit more accurately, because even off by a few centimeters would be blindingly obvious uh, to anyone coming in the room that there's, say, a gap or a big wrinkle in the carpeting, because your measurement was off by even a relatively small amount. Now, when we're communicating numbers, we want to write them in a way that indicates how good they are. And we do this by writing a number where we know the true value, whatever that true value that we're trying to obtain is, will round to the number we're generating. So let's say I measure a device or a thing. I get a value of 1.23 and whatever appropriate units I'm using. But right now we're actually focusing on the numbers. So the units are important, but we're going to look at those a little bit later on. If I report that my value is 1.23, what I'm telling the reader is that whatever the true value happens to be, I am confident that it is a number that would round to 1.23. So, since when we round, we go up on 5 or higher and down on 4 and lower, then when I'm rounding, I'm assuming that my 1.23 is representing a number that is between 1.225, which is the lowest number that would round up to 1.23, all the way to 1.23499, and keep going, which would be the largest number that would round down to 1.23. We say this 1.23 has three significant digits. Three digits that we know are legitimately true, Anything extra, we don't know, therefore it's not significant. It has not been successfully measured. Now, let's look at a few other numbers uh, to start looking at the ways of communicating things. When it comes to digits, and generally we're actually looking at the individual digits within our number, uh, any digit that's not zero, so one through nine, is going to be significant. It was measured, and we know that the digit is legitimate or that the true value would round such that that digit would exist in the rounded number. But when we look at digits that are zero, things get a little bit more interesting. Zero is a placeholder number. So it could be a digit that was measured and determined to be zero, or that zero is there as a placeholder. It wasn't there, and we would be rounding in such a way that would generate the zero, not because it's truly there, but simply that it's holding the place. If we were to write the number in scientific notation, that digit would simply go away. So let's look at a few cases of zeros and look how we're going to apply them. So let's first take the number 1.0230. In this case, we have two different types of zeros. The zero between the one and the two is what we call a sandwich zero. It's between two non-zero numbers. Uh, this is a placeholder, but it is also a number that inherently we must have measured. There's no way to measure the 1 and the 2, but not the 0. So a sandwich 0 is going to be significant. We know that 0 is legitimate. And whenever we're working with it, we can trust that number. The 0 at the end of the number is an interesting case. This appears uh, after the 3 and after the decimal point, and that is important. 
uh, this zero is not a placeholder. There is no need for that zero to exist mathematically. If we simply got rid of that last zero, then it would be the same value. So that must be placed there for a reason, and the reason would be that it was measured, and that, hey, I know that this number rounds such that the last digit is a zero. So that zero is considered significant. So right now, 1.0230, all of those numbers were measured. We consider them significant. Another example would be 0 0.0123. In this case, we have two zeros, uh, but the first zero is what we know as a safety zero. The safety zero is there to make sure that you see the decimal point. There's a fairly common error where someone would say put 0.123, but the reader may not see the decimal point. So instead of thinking that this is 0.123, they think it is 123 which is off by, shall we say, a lot. And serious errors can happen like this. By placing a zero in front of the decimal point, the reader would, of course, go, what idiot starts a number with a zero? Oh, there's a really hard to see decimal point there that I didn't see beforehand. This zero is not serving a function for the value and was not measured. This zero is purely existing for safety. This zero is not significant. It was not measured. The next zero, the one just after the decimal point, but before any of the non-zero numbers, is there as a placeholder. This is telling you that you are dealing with slightly over one one-hundredth, not slightly over one-tenth. This zero is also considered not significant. If you were to measure the number in a different unit, or use scientific notation, the zero wouldn't exist. It is simply there to get the decimal point in the right spot. Neither of these two zeros in this particular example are considered significant. Neither one can be trusted. And when we're looking at this one, we realize that, once again, we're looking at the 1, 2, and the 3, not the preceding two zeros. Generally speaking, any zeros to the left-hand side of the non-zero numbers are going to be non-significant. Now, one more example. In this case, I have 1, 2, 3, 0. This is an interesting case because there's actually a bit of a debate how I can represent this. Simply doing 1, 2, 3, 0, that last 0 is clearly a placeholder. If it wasn't there, instead of having something that's a bit over 1,000, it would be a number that's a bit over 100. And if you were to round such that you only had three significant digits, or three significant figures, that zero would have to be there as a zero. So we generally do not consider that significant. There is one school of thought that says, if that zero is significant, I could communicate it by placing a decimal point. So that any zeros between a non-zero number and the decimal point would be considered significant. This, once again, is not a universally agreed system. I do tend to follow it, but there is debate on this. Measurements on their own are useful. However, quite often we're going to be doing mathematics on our measurements. And so that we have our measured numbers and we'll do stuff with them. But as we do so, we're also going to be working with the error. Any error that you put into a mathematical equation is going to get propagated through it. So, an imperfect number to start with, and remember, all measurements are imperfect, just varying degrees of imperfection, uh, is going to transfer its imperfectness through the system. So, we want to be able to make sure that we can report our numbers that are the answer of our uh, mathematical operations in such a way that its answer will also reflect a number that the true value, the one that we don't know because of imperfection, uh, would round to that number. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. With uh, significant figures, the most straightforward way is to look at two types of equations. Uh, first, it's going to be a multiplication equation. Division, in this case, is done exactly the same way. With multiplication, uh, let's take an example uh, equation. 1.23 times 15. Now, type that in the calculator, and you'll get 18.45.
Okay. Now, do we know that it would round to the 18.45? Remember that 1.23 could be any number between 1.225 and 1.2349. Of course, those numbers won't all give you 18.45. The core question is, where is the error coming from? If we assume that the 15 doesn't have error, and there's, this is what we call an exact number, and there's two general types. First would be some form of definition, say 12 eggs in a dozen. We know it's 12, otherwise it wasn't a dozen. Alternatively, if the number was measured in such a way as it couldn't be wrong, and the only way we could do that is a count. So if we were to actually count the individuals, if you imagine a room with 15 students, you know that there is exactly 15 students, and there's not 15 and a half. You'd be calling the cops if there was half a student in the room. That would be pretty bad. So, in that case, if we have an exact 15, all of our error is going to come from the 1.23. So, our final answer would need to have the same level of precision and accuracy. In this case, it's going to have the same number of significant figures. The 1.23 had three significant figures, so the answer will also need to have three significant figures. In this case, we would round the answer to 18.5. Hey, this is me from the future over at my editing desk, and one thing I forgot to point out on here is that when we are saying uh, the answer is 18.5, we don't say it's about 18.5. Uh, literally every number isn't about, since there's error in all numbers except for uh, those that are exact. So there's no point saying it's about 18.5 as if 18.45 was the true number, because in reality, you don't know the true number. So we just say it equals 18.5. Now, it is possible that the 15 was a measured number. And since it's a measured number, there would be imperfection both in the 1.23 and in the 15. The 15 probably has more imperfection. It's only shown as having two digits, and those two digits would be its only two significant figures. So we don't truly know that that 15 is 15, only that it rounds to the 15. So our final answer can't have any more accuracy or precision than the worst one that's going into it. Since the 15 has less accuracy and precision, it's going to dominate. Or, another way of putting it, the number with the least number of significant figures will govern the number of significant figures in the answer. Since the 15 only has two significant figures, then the answer would be 18, not 18.4 or 18.45. Division is done in exactly the same way. Looking at the numbers involved, any exact numbers are generally omitted from consideration, and the number with the lowest number of significant figures will govern for the answer. With multiplication and division, the error from each number is going to affect the error of the answer relatively equally. However, in the case of addition and subtraction, there's a different story. The error in one number can be much larger than the error in the other number, and that will have an outsized effect. So when we track the error in our final answer, uh, we do so somewhat differently for addition and subtraction. We look for which one has the largest, no longer significant digit? So if I look at, say, 15 and 1.23, uh, the first significant digit in 15 is in the ones place, uh, so the tenths and beyond are not significant for the 15, but for the 1.23, both the tenths and the hundredths place are significant. It's the thousands and beyond that are no longer significant. So when I add these together, I've got a bit of a conundrum. Let's add these together kind of in the uh, old school way, like you might have done in grade school, where we stack them one on top of the other. So I have 15 plus 1.23. Now, we would say originally in grade school that this would be 0 plus 3 gives you 3. But that's not a 0. It's not 15.00. Instead, it is 15 point I don't know, I don't know, or question mark. So question mark plus three is still question mark. I don't know what this is. Likewise, I don't know plus two is still I don't know, because I don't know what I started with. So the tenths and hundredths place of my uh, sum is going to be unknown.
because I don't know one of the two numbers in there. Now, the ones place, that I can calculate. 5 plus 1 is going to be 6. So my ones place is 6, and 10 plus 0. Now, I do know that there's nothing in front of that 1 for the 1.23, so that is significant. So 1 plus nothing is 1. With addition and subtraction, the total number of significant figures will change for your final answer versus your starting numbers, depending on how things go. Multiplication and division, your number of significant figures in your final answer will be related to the lowest number of significant figures in any of your starting numbers. A few last remarks on the consideration of significant figures. When doing math, quite often we're not just doing one number. Instead, we're actually doing a lot of multiplication and or a lot of subtraction or division or a whole bunch of the stuff together. Uh, when we're doing this, uh, quite often it might be tempted to round at each step. We generally don't like doing that uh, because rounding introduces a bit of error. If you were to say always round up simply by dumb luck, then your final answer could actually be slightly larger than what it should be. We avoid this by doing one of two techniques. For starters, if possible, we just don't round. We leave the information in our calculator. Let it float some ridiculous number of digits that are totally not significant, but uh, at least they're floating around, and then we will round at the very end. This way, any of the weird rounding errors that might be produced will all go away. If this isn't practical, uh, what we can do is keep, during our calculations, those intermediate numbers, uh, keep on an extra couple of significant figures. One's actually adequate, but sometimes a couple won't hurt. Uh, but in this case, what we're doing is we're, we're still rounding, but we're not rounding as aggressively, so that any error introduced by simply rounding up or rounding down too many times uh, will get rounded away at the final number and won't affect our actual answer. When looking at equations that have both multiplication slash division and addition slash subtraction, it's a little bit annoying, and unfortunately there's no shortcuts to figuring out significant figures for your final answer. The only actual way to do so is to figure out the number of significant figures for your addition and subtraction steps, and for your multiplication steps, and then work them out in between each one, because you have two different sets of rules. Thankfully, the multiplication division set of rules for significant figures is actually a good deal simpler, and as chemists, that's the one we do the most of. So makes life simple. All you have to do is figure out who has the least number of significant figures, and that's what's in your answer. Most of the time. But of course, addition and subtraction are still a thing, and those are a tad bit annoying. A quick point about the word significant. In everyday English, we use the word to mean meaningful, that it's large and important. But in the sciences, it actually has a somewhat different meaning. Significant means that it is measurably different. A significant figure is a number or a digit that we know to be true. A significant change is a change that we can measure and know that there has been a change. It doesn't have to be a particularly large one, though. The example I like to give is if I were to give you a penny. Would your personal income, your personal net worth, be significantly more? For the English word significant, no. There's no meaningful increase for a penny. They're barely worth picking off the floor. But that is a measurable amount. Your bank account would go up by one on the very last decimal point. So it is, statistically speaking, a significant increase in your personal net worth, although it's not much. With that said, have a wonderful day.